You're listening to Conferences on Line Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is May 14, 2012, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, bronchoprovocation tests. Our presenter is Dr. Gary Salzman. He's a professor of medicine and the chief of section of pulmonary and critical care medicine at Truman Medical Center. Welcome back to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. We're now joined by Dr. Gary Salzman. Uh, Dr. Salzman is a professor of medicine and he's the uh, chief of the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at Truman Medical Center uh, here in Kansas City. And uh, Dr. Salzman uh, has agreed to speak with us today about bronchoprovocation tests. So uh, welcome to Conferences Online Allergy, Dr. Salzman. Please. Great. The All right. Keyboard. Thank you, you very much. House and uh, take it away. All right. So we're going to talk today about bronchoprovocation testing. And what I want to start with is a case. I think I always like to use a case to kind of highlight uh, the teaching points. So this is a, a case of a young woman that comes in for consultation. Uh, she's uh, had a history of asthma since age 20. She gets short of breath when she exerts herself, some chest tightness, uh, coughing. Uh, this worse with strong odors like perfume and other uh, strong odors. Stress and exercise uh, increase her symptoms. Uh, she gets some improvement in her symptoms from albuterol, but when she's on prednisone, she says she feels much better on prednisone. Uh, she's currently taking a combined inhaled steroid long acting beta agonist, a high dose. She's using her albuterol multiple times a day. She's having a lot of emergency room visits uh, and being on prednisone uh, quite a bit. Uh, denies any tobacco, ethanol, or illicit drugs. She's unemployed. Uh, she used to be a convenience store clerk. Uh, family history, she has a sister and an aunt that have asthma. So here's her physical exam. So she's uh, 285 pounds. Uh, those are her vital signs. So she's an obese female. Really pretty normal um, physical examination. Really nothing uh, abnormal on a physical exam. Uh, blood work is normal. Chest x-ray is normal. And you go ahead and do spirometry. And that's completely normal with uh, normal flow volume loops. So this is kind of a, a common patient that I see uh, referred to me. And uh, I see a lot of patients that are referred to me because they're not responding adequately to asthma medications. And what I've found over the years and 27 years of, of practice is that a lot of times the patients that are referred to me that are not responding to asthma medications, the first question I ask is, do they actually have asthma? Because if you don't have asthma, you're obviously not going to respond to the medications. We actually do have fairly good medications these days. And, uh, if people are really taking the medications and they're not working, you really need to go back to the beginning and make sure that your diagnosis is, is correct. And so I spend a lot of time going back and trying to establish whether a patient has asthma or they don't have asthma or if they have asthma plus some additional uh, problems so that I can optimally manage them. Now, some people would suggest, well, asthma is a clinical diagnosis and you can make it based on symptoms and response to therapy. I would disagree with that. I think I'm from Missouri. I'm from the show me state. You have to show me that they have asthma. Um, they have to demonstrate that they have uh, reversibility to bronchodilators, a 12% improvement in, in FEV1 after administration of bronchodilators. Or uh, if you can't show me that, um, they've got normal pulmonary function studies. I want a bronchoprovocation test to demonstrate that this is indeed asthma. And so why am I so concerned about making an accurate diagnosis because, most importantly, there are life-threatening conditions that can resemble asthma, that can cause shortness of breath, uh, can cause dyspnea on exertion, things like um, pulmonary embolism, uh, things like heart failure, um, problems uh, like uh, coronary artery disease uh, can cause a shortness of breath on exertion. Um, so there's some, some fairly significant life-threatening conditions that can resemble asthma. And, I've come to, to know over the years that some patients, when they complain of shortness of breath, they interchangeably use the word asthma. And they will tell people that they have asthma or shortness of breath, the same thing to them. 
Um, and so I try to dig a little deeper when people are saying, oh, yeah, I've had asthma for many, many years, and try to, to go through and try to um, make some kind of objective determination of whether this is indeed asthma or it's something else. Now, gastroesophageal reflux disease I, I do see commonly in this group of patients referred, particularly that aren't responding to asthma medications. And I've got a little bit of different take on reflux than a lot of people. A lot of people uh, believe that reflux actually causes asthma and that if you treat the reflux that their asthma will get better. And that the reason that they're not responding to asthma medications is they have uncontrolled reflux. Um, my take on this is that reflux causes independent symptoms, independent of asthma. It causes definitely cough. It causes mucus. Uh, it causes chest tightness that I believe in many patients is independent of the diagnosis of asthma. Now, they may have reflux symptoms and asthma symptoms. Uh, they may have hoarseness or, you know, the laryngeal pharyngeal uh, reflux. But I, I believe that it's important to differentiate, you know, whether their symptoms, their cough is from asthma, where they should have a positive bronchoprovocation test, or are their symptoms from reflux, which, you know, would certainly uh, improve with reflux medication. So, I, I really believe that those two oftentimes need to be differentiated, particularly in patients that are obese, will have chronic cough, can have sputum production from reflux. And so I don't necessarily believe that, that reflux is a direct cause of asthma, but I believe it causes symptoms that are similar to asthma, including cough and sputum production and chest tightness, uh, in addition to the other classical symptoms of reflux. So I think reflux is important to to evaluate, and in some patients we go as far as doing esophageal pH monitoring to make sure that, that they actually do have reflux and that reflux is what's causing their symptoms. Do you think reflux can trigger asthma? Um, I think it's possible, but I think that a lot of patients, in my experience, have cough that's related mm -hmm. to reflux, but is not related to asthma. It's mm -hmm. a and I see a subset of patients who refer to me for refractory asthma, who are refractory to all medications, who I do bronchoprovocation testing and find they do not have asthma, but they do have cough from reflux. Hmm. And once I treat their reflux, their cough goes away, and they don't need asthma medications. And so what I see a lot in the community is people referring, and they're on all kinds of asthma medications, um, and they're, they're having reflux symptoms. And they may be on some, you know, reflux therapy, but it's not effective. But then I still go back to the beginning, do bronchoprovocations tests, see whether they have asthma or not. And many of these patients don't have asthma, but they do have cough, mucus production from the reflux. And I just treat the reflux, and I don't treat asthma in those patients. I stop all their asthma medications, treat the reflux, uh, and then do fairly well. I had a lawyer one time, <coughs> about seven or eight years ago, came to see me, was on all kinds of asthma medications, weren't working at all. She had such a bad cough that she couldn't even be in court anymore because she was coughing all the time. I did a, a methacholine challenge on her. It was completely normal. Stopped all of her asthma medications. I put her on an aggressive regimen for reflux. Her cough in two weeks could went away completely. She had no more cough. And she could also stop all of the asthma medications that she was taking that she was insisting were not helping her at all. None of the asthma medications were helping her. And she just had reflux uh, and had cough from the reflux. So I, I think that, you know, they, they may be related. But just because you're having cough doesn't mean you have asthma. And just because... Uh, uh, you know, you have reflux doesn't mean that reflux makes the asthma worse. So I think reflux is an important thing. And, and this lady, the one that we presented, I think that's certainly a big issue is we need to think about whether some of her symptoms are from reflux. Deconditioning, again, is very, very common. We see a lot of patients who are obese who are deconditioned. The only symptom they have is dyspnea on exertion. They say at rest they never have any problems. And when you ask them, you say, what helps your shortness of breath when I rest? When I sit down and rest, it goes away. What, do you have to take an inhaler? No. If I just sit down and rest, if I take an inhaler, it'll work. But if I rest, it'll work too. Uh, and so some of those patients, they, they don't have asthma. They have deconditioning. And you can, you know, you can demonstrate that on an exercise study where their heart rate will, um, will go up uh, very rapidly. They won't be able to, um, to exercise very long. And, you know, deconditioning is a very common common problem. And obviously, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. You don't want to miss somebody that has pulmonary hypertension or coronary artery disease or heart failure or some other kind of problem. So it's, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. Now, vocal cord dysfunction is a little bit more difficult, particularly when you're talking about bronchoprovocation studies, because oftentimes in our lab with vocal cord dysfunction, 
when we start doing the test, the patient will start having uh, vocal cord dysfunction symptoms, and then the test will be stopped. Tests are usually stopped when people have a drop in lung function or if they have symptoms. Uh, and just like you guys do uh, control with your allergy testing, you do controls of histamine and saline. We do the same thing with bronchial propagation. The first um, nebulized uh, thing that you get in bronchial propagation is saline. You get a control. And so uh, oftentimes the BCD patient will immediately respond to the saline and start having symptoms and we have to stop the test. Um, and then you're really not able to complete the test. So BCD sometimes, uh, you know, will demonstrate symptoms during a bronchoprovocation test, but they won't demonstrate drop in function. But sometimes it's it's difficult to uh, to continue the test if they're still having because the techs are are told to stop the test. If the patient has symptoms or if they have a drop in lung function. And so the tech can't differentiate BCD symptoms from asthma symptoms, and so they'll stop the test. Would you not see at the time that you're doing like the spirometry, like be able to see the flattening on the yeah, inventory release yeah. and say, well, you know, that's right. what happened. So we look at the, we do have flow volume loops and we can look at those, right? So, but then it, it kind of makes it difficult because then some people have vocal cord dysfunction and asthma. Right. Mm. So then it's hard, it's hard to, to differentiate that. But um, really most of the patients with VCD can, can go through the whole study. And I've had many patients that can go all the way through bronchial provocations will not have symptoms. I would say the majority that we can still test and we can get them through the whole um, study um, as long as they're not under a stressful condition or, you know, some, something's going on. Uh, but most of the patients we can get through. So VCD is, is another issue and that may be, and that may be uh, in patients that um, have asthma, they have VCD and asthma, or they may just have VCD and, and no asthma. Um, it's interesting that with the VCD, um, about, I don't know how long, about 10 or 15 years ago, the International Olympic Committee uh, ruled that all asthma medications were, could be performance enhancing. And so before an athlete could take asthma medications, you had to have absolute uh, documentation that they really had asthma. And so, um, you know, the simple one is if they had 12% reversibility, then that would be okay. But a lot of the Olympic athletes didn't have the reversibility, so they went ahead and did uh, provocation studies. They did exercise, they did um, methacholine, and they found a significant percentage of these elite Olympic athletes had negative methacholine challenges. And so then they went one step further, and they did laryngoscopy on these uh, individuals, and they did it at their training facilities. So if they were a runner, they did it at the track. If they were a swimmer, they brought the laryngoscope to the pool and they scoped these people, and they found that a very high percentage of these people that thought they had asthma had no asthma, but they had vocal cord dysfunction. So uh, it's fairly common in Olympic athletes and, and elite athletes. And I actually see that in my practice. When I get some patients that are referred to me for refractory asthma, I find they don't have asthma, but they have VCD. A lot of these people are athletes, you know, high school athletes or college athletes um, that, you know, uh, participate. And so uh, that's, that's something that, that's interesting. Heart failure can certainly give you a symptom, a wheezing, a shortness of breath. Uh, pulmonary embolism <coughs> can give you wheezing, shortness of breath. Um, sarcoidosis, which we see fairly commonly, uh, that can also, again, it can respond to systemic corticosteroids, although it won't usually respond to inhaled corticosteroids. So uh, pulmonary fibrosis, uh, rhinosinusitis, hyperventilation or anxiety, Sometimes I get patients who come in and say, if I could only just take a deep breath, I would be all right. It's just that I, I feel really short of breath, but if I take a really deep breath, if I get a deep breath in, then I can feel all right. And what those patients are doing is they're hyperventilating. And they're breathing very, very shallow, and they're not really getting an adequate amount of volume. And when they relax and they slow down and take a deep breath, then uh, their symptoms will, will improve. But again, I don't... Um, from Missouri, I'm just gonna, not going to say somebody has hyperventilation before I actually prove that they don't have asthma. So I think that it's worth the, the time and effort to go through a formalized way to, to make to rule in or rule out the diagnosis of asthma so you know exactly what you're dealing with. You don't want to underdiagnose and have somebody die from an asthma attack because you stopped all their medicines. You don't want to overdiagnose and have somebody have all the side effects from chronic steroids or beta agonists. Uh, and, and have problems that way. So you, you want to differentiate that. Some people use response to asthma therapy, and, and I think that that's misleading, and that somebody says, yeah, you know, I felt a little better when I took albuterol. I think it helped me some. Um, that, or even if they say it helped me a lot. 
Uh, I'm not certain that there is a, you, you are going to get some effect from a beta agonist even if you don't have asthma. You're going to have an increased heart rate, you're going to have some tremor. So people are going to feel something and they may translate that into feeling better. And of course systemic steroids have a euphoric effect. You go on a short course of steroids, you're going to feel better. In general, you're going to feel better. It may not treat your, your problem, but you are going to have some feeling of, of well-being when you're on systemic steroids. So I don't think that that makes the diagnosis of, of asthma. Certainly costs and side effects are, are big issues. Uh, these medications are not cheap. Uh, they do have side effects. In my experience, it seems like people that do not have asthma have more side effects from the medications or complain about them more. I had a patient a couple years ago who was admitted for an asthma attack. And every time they gave her a nebulized albuterol, she had extreme tachycardia and extreme tremor. I went and examined her, I did methacholine challenge on her, and found that she had very severe vocal cord dysfunction, no asthma at all, stopped all of her medications, got her on some intense therapy for vocal cord dysfunction, she's doing very, very well. But she was having really severe side effects from just normal doses of agonists. Uh, and I don't know why that is, but it seems like patients that don't have asthma have more side effects from a medication. And maybe that's why they don't have asthma, because they're physiologically more responsive to the things that keep their airways dilated. Maybe true. Maybe so. But it does. It seems to be that they have more side effects. And then, of course, the, the life-threatening problems. I, I think those are certainly an issue. So what are the indications? So first, you've got to start with somebody with normal or near-normal lung function. Obviously, if you're already demonstrating airflow obstruction on pulmonary functions, then you know at least you have some airflow obstruction. You may have asthma, you may have COPD, uh, but we're really talking about people with normal or near normal PFTs. Uh, if they have atypical symptoms, and I had a patient not too long ago, and she gave me this bizarre history. It didn't make any sense. Um, and so I did a methacholine challenge, and it was positive. She had asthma. She couldn't relate her symptoms very well. She didn't give a very good history. And so I, I thought her symptoms were very atypical. But she did have a positive methacholine, and maybe it was I wasn't listening very well to her, but she had uh, what I thought were atypical symptoms. Uh, like in the patient I presented, they got normal pulmonary functions, and they're not responding to good asthma therapy, and they're actually taking the medicine. I think that's a red flag. If you're taking the medicines that we have today, which are very good, which work in the majority of patients, the patient's actually taking them, and they're not working. That really raises a big flag. Do they really have asthma? Maybe they have something else. Um, if you're suspicious of something else, uh, another diagnosis. Uh, and then, like we said, Olympic athletes, in order for them to be able to take asthma medications, you have to prove with proper provocation testing that they have asthma. Another group is um, the scuba divers. You have to prove that you don't have asthma to be able to scuba dive. And so um, there uh, is bronchoprovocation testing for people who have had a history of asthma before they can um, I get approval to, to go scuba diving. Because as you could imagine, if you're 90 feet down under the water and you have an asthma attack, um, it's not going to be a good thing for you. Um, and then the other is the military. Um, the, in the military, if you've had any kind of history, even if you had history as a young child of asthma and never had any problems the rest of your life, when you're going to um, enroll in the military, they have to usually have a bronchoprovocation test. It used to be they had to have exercise testing. Uh, but now they've kind of uh, loosened that, and you can do other types of bronchoprovocation testing. But military um, has to have proof that you don't have asthma um, before uh, you can, uh, you can, because uh, obviously, again, if you're in the military and you're running and you're in kind of a war situation, you have an asthma attack. It's obviously not good for you and not good for your other soldiers. Uh, suspicion of occupational asthma, reactive airway dysfunction syndrome. I see some patients with the occupational asthma. I saw a patient with the, was a painter in a car factory. He was exposed to toluene diisocyanide, TDI. Another one that worked in a glue factory. Um, those patients did have reactive airways dysfunction syndrome from the exposure. They didn't have asthma before, but after the toxic exposure, they had airway reactivity. So that confirmed that diagnosis. And in a medical legal sense, they needed that confirmation that they actually had reactive airways uh, disease. And so in some of those, I had another patient that was exposed to ammonia gas, uh, and he demonstrated airway reactivity. So that was um, uh, the other thing. And then in, in some of our research studies, what we look at is if you do an intervention, and then and you want to ex expect that this intervention is going to improve the patient, if they're starting with near-normal pulmonary functions, you really can't depend on PFTs to change much. 
So then what you might see is an increase in your the amount of say methacholine that it takes to cause a drop in your lung function. So maybe before therapy it was at four and then after therapy it goes up to eight, which would indicate that there may be some therapeutic benefit to whatever investigational drug that you're looking at. So uh, we do that in some of our studies where we do serial methacholine challenges to see if there's a difference in reactivity in terms of the response to the uh, investigated therapy. So what are the absolute contraindications? Uh, FEV1 less than 50% are predicted. That makes a lot of sense. If you're looking for a 20% drop in, in FEV1 and you're already below 50%, you're, you're not going to be doing very well if you're already starting that low. So that's an absolute contraindication. If you had a heart attack or your blood pressure is sky high, you've got aortic aneurysm, those are some absolute contraindications. Relative contraindications, and I've changed this from what's in the literature. The literature says 60%. I don't know of anybody that will do um, bronchial provocations at FEV1s of 60, 69%. Uh, Usually most people use 70% as a cutoff uh, for bronchial provocation, so I put that in there. Obviously, if a patient can't do spirometry and that's an issue, then he, you can't do um, the testing because you're looking at spirometry. So if they can't do the spirometry, you're going to have problems. Pregnancy, nursing mothers. Uh, again, if you had a, a huge drop in your lung function, uh, you could perceivably uh, cause some problems here. So there are some absolute and relative contraindications that you should know. Uh, so this is always comes up. When you order um, uh, testing, what medicines do you need to stop and how long do you have to be off of the medications? Um, so for uh, short-acting beta agonist and chromalin, uh, it's usually said eight hours. They should be off at least eight hours. For hypotropium and monolucas, 24 hours. Uh, for the labas and theophylline, 48 hours. Really all antihistamines, whether they're um, sedating or non-sedating, uh, 72 hours. Uh, one week for teotropium and two to three weeks for inhaled and, and oral corticosteroids. So that's uh, what's recommended. And, you know, the way that I go about this, a lot of times I see people and they're already on lots of different medications. And so basically my first question is, is this medication helping you? And oftentimes they say, no, it's not helping me at all. And so I say, well, if it's not helping you, why don't we stop it? You can stop everything except your short-acting beta agonist, and you can use that on an as-needed basis, but hold it eight hours before you come in for testing. So at least you know, if they have asthma, they have something. Uh, but generally, you know, these things are not uh, being, uh, are not effective anyway for them, and they have really no problem stopping them. Other patients, it may be more difficult to stop uh, some of their maintenance therapy, and that may be more difficult, because if you don't stop these, then you could get a, a false negative in terms of if they're taking medications right up to the time when they're doing the, the testing, you may get a false negative if they continue to take their medication. So sometimes that's an issue. So what kind of agents do we use for bronchial provocation? Uh, right now there's two that are FDA approved. Um, uh, that's methacholine and then just recently mannitol. Um, people have used histamine uh, before, although it's not, uh, there's no FDA approved form of histamine for bronchoconstriction. But basically methacholine and histamine cause uh, bronchospasm from direct stimulation of airway smooth muscle receptors. Uh, mannitol, uh, exercise, uh, eucapnic hyperventilation, some of the other things, they cause more of an indirect um, uh, bronchoconstriction through intermediate uh, pathways. And so there's direct and then there's indirect. In terms of sensitivity, methacholine is very sensitive. If you withhold all the medications as recommended, you're going to have a fairly high sensitivity, uh, although uh, it's not very specific. Mannitol is much more specific, but not as sensitive. And so when, when I'm doing uh, proper provocation testing, my question is like in the case that I presented, my question is, can I rule out asthma? Can I safely rule out asthma? So if I'm trying to rule out asthma, then I will do a methacholine challenge because I want to have a fairly high certainty that this patient doesn't have asthma. I'm going to look for something else, stop their asthma medications, and try to, uh, to look for something else. The mannitol would be more, if you're asking a question, I need to make the diagnosis of asthma. I want to see if this patient, yes, they definitely have asthma or not. So mannitol would be, would be the better the choice there. And so in terms of what kind of patient, so in clinical practice, when I have this patient with atypical symptoms and normal PFTs that I think doesn't have asthma and I want to prove that, I'll do a methacholine challenge. 
If, for instance, though, that I want to have somebody evaluate them for the military and see if they can be in the military, what I want to see is I want to see, you know, because they want to be in the military. So I'll do mannitol. If the mannitol is positive, then they won't be able to serve. If the mannitol is negative, then, then they can still go into the, into the military. Uh, scuba diving, same kind of thing. You could do mannitol for those, those patients. Olympic athletes, um, you could do either one. Some people say that if you really wanted to be sure, you could do both of these because one is looking at indirect and one's looking at direct. And if you combine both of them together, you're going to have even a, a higher sensitivity. But they, they measure different things, and you would do a different tests for different type of patients. Um, but I think in my clinical practice, most of the time, I'm looking to rule out asthma and having a fairly high confidence that they do not have asthma. So that's why I would choose methacholine uh, over, uh, over, say, mannitol. So how do we do methacholine challenge? The first thing the patient has to do is they have to come in and they have to do acceptable spirometry. So they have to be able to, to do a, a good test. And they have to have an FEV1 that's greater than 70% predicted. So if they come in and their FEV1 is 50% predicted, then the test is over. We don't want to go any farther than that. So they have to have acceptable spirometry and they have to have a relatively near normal FEV1. We start with uh, just a control, just like you guys do for our allergy testing. You start with controls, we start with controls. We want to make sure they're not going to respond to the control like an ECD patient may. Um, there's uh, at least two different um, methods. Uh, in our clinical PFT lab, we use an accelerated five-step method. So we start with a very, uh, very dilute uh, solution of ethicoline, and then we go up to um, a relatively high uh, uh, concentration over a short period of time. Um, and in those patients who you clinically do not think have asthma, it's probably safe to do this uh, because you're starting low enough uh, that you can accelerate fairly uh, rapid. On a research standpoint, when you want to look at changes in PC20, uh, then you really want to do a 10-step method. Uh, here at Mercy, they do a 10-step method for their methacholine because it's safer. Um, and so the 10-step method is, is done. When our clinical lab, we do the 5-step method. Because the 5-step method could take over an hour. The 10-step method could take you know, much longer. So um, it's just a matter of um, safety and discrimination whether you do the 5- or 10-step method. Um, so you stop the test when uh, the best FEV1 drops below 20% of the baseline and then you calculate uh, the PC20. Uh, and then the PFT tech is instructed to nebulize albuterol until their FEV1 returns to baseline. So they can't leave the lab until they get their FEV1 back to baseline. So then the physician's called if the patient still hasn't gotten their FEV1 back up. Most of the time, they respond very well to albuterol. We, we, haven't, we haven't, the only one problem we ever had in the PFT lab was a patient with vocal cord dysfunction that started having severe symptoms, wheezing, and shortness of breath, and said she was going to die. And her pulmonary functions, her FEV1 didn't drop at all. But she had lots and lots of symptoms. Do you ever find them like drop just, I mean, or unable to interpret because they're having so much any issues that they just don't give a good effort and then it's really hard to... Well, that's what we, they okay. have to do when they start. So they have to be able to sure. do a good effort. But like as you go along, like if it's a BCD patient, it kind of just irritates them or they get stressed out or worried, like then it's kind of hard, right? They just, do they just get tired of... Yeah, their effort just yeah. gets worse over time. You know, really, most of the people can do it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they, um, they're usually doing two, um, two reproducible, two or three uh, spirometries each dilution. And so, usually, I, it's very rare. I mean, I would say probably less than 5%, you know, can't finish the test. Um, most of the people are able to do it. So they have to have a certain, they can't be variable. Right. They're three efforts. They have to be within 5%, right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, again, you have people that try to look for disability or something, and if you try to, to game this thing, mm -hmm. well, you can't, you can't um, do a 50% effort each time. You're going to do a 40%, a 60 you know, you're going to be all over the place. So when you have that variability, yeah, then it, we throw those out. You have to have within 5% each each time to, to have it reproduce. Um, Wouldn't the 10-step method actually give you a larger cumulative dose of methacholine, or is it, such, is it so short-lived that it's out of the It does. It gives you a little bit more. Uh, but, I mean, as you go up in the dose, you know, really when you get into 16, that's really when you're, when you're really... And that's the, the really the cutoff for me. I mean, if they get all the way up to 16 and they don't have any drop, 
And I feel pretty confident that they don't have asthma. But yeah, because the other little doses are just you know, tiny little doses. So I mean, they do have a little bit more um, accumulation. You're right. But I don't think methicolin doesn't have much cumulative effect. No. No. It's, right. It's gone very quickly. It's ephemeral. Right, it's gone, and that's why the test is really safe. A lot of people are all upset, you know, that this is a dangerous test and you can cause bronchospasm, but it's very short-lived. There's no late phase response, so you don't have to worry about them later on that night having problems. Um, they will they will drop, and really, it's it's interesting. <laughs> some of the patients that we that we do, the only way that we know they have a positive test is looking at their lung function. They may not have any symptoms at all. I mean, some people will cough a little bit, uh, but you're using, you know, you're going up and, and you know. A lot of patients won't feel anything, and they'll stop the test just based on their spirometry. They won't even feel anything. So it's most of the patients are not uh, having any problems. Well, you see, really, yeah, really severe asthma can respond to the normal oh. saline control as well. Mm -hmm. It's not just VCD. Mm -hmm. That's known as the British. The, it's a fog challenge, I think is mm -hmm. what it's called. So uh, you have to really do the laryngoscopy at the same time that you see this uh, saline control. And if there's no VCD, then you just have to assume that they're just so hyper-responsive, just the uh, saline is enough to trigger irritation. And there are a lot of uh, asthmatics who have pure asthma on that, that issue as well. Although you can have both uh, VCD and asthma overlap. But if you have the normal saline being positive in terms of a 20% drop in FEV1, and you do a laryngoscopy at the same time, you don't see any kind of PCD, then that's just, uh, they're so sensitive, they're all way to the left on the curve. Usually, um, PC20 of eight or less is, is a positive test. Um, PC20 of uh, greater than 16 um, is a negative test. Um, if you know, if, what if your PC what if you're positive at 16 but you're negative at 8? What does that mean? That means that you can't rule out asthma. It doesn't mean that you have asthma. It means that you can't rule out asthma. And so, uh, you know, those patients, that, you know, are a little bit more difficult. But you know, you you feel a little less confident about stopping all their asthma meds, even if they only respond at 16. But if they get all the way up to 16 and they don't respond, I think it's pretty good evidence that they probably don't have asthma, as long as they withheld their medication. Could you follow that up with a mannitol? Yeah, you could. Yeah, you could do the mannitol, too. So sensitivity, very good. Specificity for PC20 of 8 is only about 50%. And so there's false positives, allergic rhinitis, cystic fibrosis, heart failure, COPD, smoking. Smokers, about up to a quarter of smokers will have a positive um, methacholine challenge. Viral infections. So again, the methacholine challenge isn't really a good test to say for sure this patient definitely has asthma. It, it's a better test to say this patient doesn't have asthma uh, in terms of uh, sensitivity. And that's why I use it. I use it to try to rule out asthma, not to make the diagnosis of asthma. Mannitol, um, the, the advantage of mannitol and, and why more people are using mannitol is it's a much easier test to give because methacholine has to be mixed up by the pharmacist. It has to be uh, you know, exacting concentrations. And then it only lasts for one day. If a patient doesn't show for their test, then you have to discard all that methacholine. You've got to start over because it, it doesn't last for a day, more than a day. Mannitol comes in actually these little um, blister packs of dry powder capsules that um, you, know, you can do. You don't have to, the pharmacist doesn't have to mix it up. And so you, you don't have it all the pharmacy uh, charged. It's a dry powder. Uh, it's usually a nine-step test from zero to 160 milligrams. Uh, if that people want to drop greater than 10 percent but less than 15 percent, you repeat that same dose. You stop when the FPV1 drops by 50 percent, or by 15 percent, and you look at a PD15. Uh, if the cumulative dose is 635 or less, then that would be a positive test. Um, so we, we're getting set up to do um, uh, mannitol. We haven't started doing them yet, but um, it, I think it will be easier for our techs. But the only thing I'm worried about is that. Um, sensitivity is not as high as methacholine. So I can have people that have negative mannitol studies but still have asthma. So that well, might look 15 good. instead of 20. No, no, that's, that's what they did the studies. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's what but they're, they're doing PD-15, yeah, mm -hmm. not 20. Yeah. And this is the little device that they use for that mannitol. It put, it's just like, uh, like Spiriva or some of the other dry powders. You put the capsule in there and then 
uh, which is much easier. We, they have to do dosimeters with methacholines. You have to have a very exact, you have to have tidal breathing. They're not supposed to be doing deep breath breathing. Yeah. It's just tidal breathing. So the methacholine, you know, is a little bit more complicated to do than the, the mannitol. So exercise challenge, um, you emit the medications for the same period. Uh, it's, uh, you uh, have to tell patients not to do vigorous exercise that day because you know there's a refractory period uh, after exercise that, that you may not see a, a drop. And so uh, you, you have to be aware of that. You do baseline spirometry and then 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes after exercise. Usually they exercise for only about 8 to 10 minutes. Although when we used to do the military people, we, they would bring in these young guys that were in incredible shape. <laughs> And we had to we had to they had to run on the treadmill to get their heart rate up high enough because they have to be eighty percent of their maximum heart rate. And for a twenty year old, that's one hundred and sixty. So they get their heart rate, and these kids come in, their heart rate's resting heart rate's fifty. Hours. Yeah, their heart resting heart rate's fifty. So we got to get them up to one hundred and sixty. We're having them run like full speed straight up the treadmill <laughs> to get their heart rate up, you know, to one hundred and five minutes. Right. So you know, when, when some of these elite athletes, it, you really have to exercise them uh, a lot to get to get up to where you want to go. So you, you monitor their, their heart and their blood pressure, their pulse ox. Um, ideally, you're supposed to deliver it, the dry medical air by mouth valve because, you know, it's, a, it's depending on the humidity of the lab, it could change your, um, uh, your results. And so you can use a treadmill or a cycle ergometer. And again, you got to get to 80% of maximum heart rate. So for, yeah, a 20-year-old, that's a heart rate of 160. Uh, and if they're in great shape, that's a lot of um, exercise. Uh, they should reach at least 40% of their maximum voluntary ventilation, which is FED1 times 40. And a positive test, some people say 10, some people say 15% in FED1. I've seen both, so I put both down 10 to 15%. 15% is going to give you um, a higher specificity. Obviously, 10% is going to give you a higher sensitivity. And then you have to give albuterol until the FED1 uh, returns to baseline. This is what we used to have to do for all the military. That's the only thing they would accept was exercise. Mm -hmm. Now they're accepting methacholine and other bronchoprovocation. So uh, we're doing uh, the military people now with methacholine. I think we're doing. Uh, I when I I used to evaluate a lot of military mm -hmm. going to the Air Force Academy, mm -hmm. and they were like high school students. Some of them were elite athletes in high school, mm -hmm. and they would come in with a history of uh, having a um, <clears throat> a uh, flu or a respiratory illness in February before they were going to matriculate. Mm. And their uh, pre-induction exam was a question whether or not they uh, really have asthma. So they would send them to, to us to sort of evaluate uh, that. And I would do all I could to avoid doing a methacholine challenge in those patients and try and get whatever other data I can to support it. Occasionally even exercise because I think that specificity is a little less even there. Mm -hmm. and they can handle the exercise better. But you mean those kids they really wanted to avoid having the asthma label. Right. And uh right. not the calling challenge. At, at the time that all wasn't available. Right. I, I think uh, you know, there's some circumstances where it's clear post viral circumstance and they've had some symptoms that don't really represent asthma in the patient. We might want to not do the methacholine right. because uh, we may falsely label them, even with the right kind of analysis of the test. Right, yeah, I mean, the specificity only 50%, right? You can <coughs> get over diagnosed asthma, and the kid's going to be obviously pretty upset if they can't get into the military academies. Yeah, we used to see a lot of those kinds of same circumstances, especially at the Air Force Academy, where they wanted to um, do flight training. But if they needed any medication for allergic rhinitis, it disqualified them from flight training. Mm. So in fact, uh, Hal Nelson's protocol for rush immunotherapy came out of trying to get these uh, kids on a you know a, a, a maintenance dose as soon as possible, so that they could uh, be under treatment long enough to qualify for flight training mm. at uh, the Air Force Academy. So yeah. it's military circumstances that are sometimes. Interesting, but uh, right. there's labeling the right kind of diagnosis is important, but uh, mm -hmm. it alters, you know, eligibility for oh, health yeah. insurance. And it's a big difference. Uh, yeah, I mean, so yeah, exercise is more specific. Um, so that you know, for a military, you know, or a diver, that probably you know would be better than, than methacholine. 
you can't, you can't make voluntary hyperpnea is another test that would kind of simulate exercise. It, it is approved by the International Olympic Committee, so you can do this. Um, it's, a, again, a, 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 an indirect test. <coughs> and uh, uh, you, they breathe in a dry hypercapnic air 30 times a minute. They have to achieve 85% of maximum voluntary ventilation. You do spirometry. Here, a positive test is 10% fall uh, in FEV1. So for the Olympics, they want to have asthma so they can take the medicine. Right? I'm not convinced it really is performance enhancing. Do I mean, you think it's performance enhancing? Well, if you <laughs> if you can't breathe because you have asthma and you use it and it opens your airways, right. it enhances your performance right. in that case. But if you don't have asthma, it, it probably be, doesn't do too much. I wouldn't think so. But I guess the International Olympic Committee is saying that it could possibly improve performance, so it's it's restricted. Right. Remember Mark Spitz? He had asthma. He won the five or seven gold medals, right? Mm -hmm. But I think that it might have been after that because I think there was controversy about whether it was asthma. Yeah, no, that same Olympic spins one. There was another swimmer who got disqualified for asthma, some guy named DeMott, who had been taking, like, you know, the equivalent of, uh, of um, Sudafed uh -huh. and uh, tested positive in the early days of testing for different Right, because it could look like an amphetamine or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, none of these medications give you super normal responses. No. So if you're normal and you take it, you don't get super normal. Yeah. So the idea that they're performance enhancing is a little bit specious. If you're underperforming because you have an illness and you come back to your normal performance, that's not performance enhancement. That's true. That's true. Um, Food additive challenge. I don't really have much um, exp any, any uh, experience with this. But Lenny, do you have any experience with food additive challenges? Not to look for uh, asthma. I mean, yeah, I would think it'd be pretty challenges good. for patients who have uh, urticaria and mm -hmm. some other kinds of processes. Right. I used to see all this sulfide stuff. Did that disappear? Whatever happened to the sulfide stuff? Yeah, they're still around. I think. Or did they take it out of all the foods so we don't see it anymore? I think it's a, it's a it's still a factor. The, this tartrazine business, not the sulfite, was based on some data that came out of Australia that suggested it was really uh, very potent in a subgroup of patients with asthma, like, you know, 25 years Did ago. Did you ever see anyone yeah. react to tartrazine? I think that data was shown to be specious mm. or, and not, not properly collected, let's put it that way. I don't know if you guys remember that. You probably... You guys were not fellows then, probably, or whatever. But we used to do the tang tiles. Yeah, no, and I've done those more for urticaria and for some of the other kinds of things you associate with yeah. additives, but not for asthma. And I think there was a time when tartrazine was considered to be a potential trigger for asthma in select subjects, especially ones who are aspirin sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, but none of that data held up, and it was based on two or three reports that came out of Australia that were later found to be able to produce them. Mm -hmm. Well, we used to do tartrazine tests all the time, and mm -hmm. we never found a positive. <laughs> I think it's pretty rare in asthmatics that that would be a trigger for your asthma, would be a food additive. I don't think that would be very common. Now, antigen challenge, um, you know, that really is more of a research tool. And here, you really do have to worry about late phase response. So a lot of these people, you maybe have to monitor for up to 24 hours if you're going to have a late phase response. So that, you know, is uh, I think there was a subject in one of Johns Hopkins studies that died from an antigen challenge. I think it was like four or five years ago. Yeah, it was uh, an unusual circumstance. It was an antigen challenge, but it was they had given the patient hexamethonium to look at ganglionic blockers. Mm -hmm. uh, at those studies, Alcus Toyas was the PI at, uh, at Hopkins, but they had used hexamethonium, which wasn't FDA approved, but it was in USP. People had given it for smokers and from other things like 100 years ago. But uh, controversy related to the fact that the hexamethonium was not FDA approved, so that it wasn't in high end. Right, right. But it was, uh, it was a lab technician who worked at Hopkins who was participating in a research study that was trying to study ganglionic blockers' effects on asthma, right. allergen challenge. Right. Right. And unfortunately, the, there was a young woman passed away. She died, right? I remember that, yeah. Hopkins' research, uh, clinical research, was put on hold. Oh, yeah, that was a big deal. Yeah. A long time, about 15 years ago. So here I'm going to finish with the case. 
So this is um, a lady who was evaluated for asthma, symptoms of shortness of breath on exertion after she came back from her winter home in Florida. No prior history of asthma, non-smoker. She has one adult daughter with asthma. She used her daughter's albuterol, and she said she got a little bit fatter. The medication she was on, Primarin, uh, for uh, menopause symptoms. So uh, exams, spirometry, x-ray, echocardiogram, blood tests are all pretty normal. So uh, a clinical diagnosis of asthma was made based on uh, improvement in symptoms with albuterol. So the patient returns after two weeks. She says, yeah, she's using her albuterol three to four times a day. She's getting some improvement in her symptoms. Spirometry is normal. So she's added a long-acting beta agonist and held steroid. Three days after she starts on that, she calls and says she's having palpitations from the new inhaler. And she switched to uh, fluticasone over the phone, told to return in two weeks. And the palpitations improve, but they don't resolve. When she comes back, she still has shortness of breath and exertion. Now she's waking up at night. And so she's starting on lots of Lucast. And then the patient has cardiopulmonary arrest at the airport. And autopsy reveals uh, recent and remote pulmonary embolism. So, you know, the moral of the story is that it's probably not a good idea to just empirically diagnose somebody based on response to treatment or clinical symptoms. That they've got symptoms and they got normal pulmonary functions, it makes sense to go ahead and try to prove do they have asthma or do they not have asthma um, because you obviously don't want to miss a life-threatening condition. That's uh, tough because she was responding to albuterol, you know. So. At least she said she was responding. Yeah. Maybe she wanted to make her doctor happy. <laughs> or is there a high index of suspicion in a 58-year-old nuance of asthma? Right. Yeah, nuance out of the blue. Right. right. Yeah. And she turned from travel. Right, but I mean, you know, I see this in the community a lot with primary care docs who just say, okay, well, you've got some shortness of breath, we'll just give you some asthma medicine, and if it seems to work, then okay, we diagnose you with asthma. But, you know, the thing is, is that they could have other things that could be life-threatening that you wouldn't even think about. Uh, I've seen similar circumstances in patients in the mid-20s who have uh, uh, a URI and then wheezing episodes and cough, and cough persists, and they're just treated with... Uh, asthma medicine, they end up having some mycoplasma and some other things that last for a little bit longer than uh, usual URI. Yeah. So you have the, uh, and not the mycoplasma that causes uh, that. Right. So are you recommending that bronchial challenges be done on all patients before you'll make a diagnosis of asthma? I, I want to see objective data, and so whether that's 12% reversibility or peak flow data. So if I can get peak flow, like, well, I'll look for peak flow data in the ER. If they say I was in the ER last month, I'll go back and look. Peak flow was 150 when you came into the ER. After they treated you, peak flow went up to 400. That's pretty good evidence that you have airway reversibility. On the other hand, if they come in and their peak flow was 350 when they got there and it was 350 when they left, then they still don't have any reversibility. So I really like to see either a demonstration of airway reversibility, peak flow, or FEV1, or methicoline, or if they have obstruction. I mean, obviously, if they have an FEV1 that's 55% of predicted, they've got airflow obstruction. Then, that, but you know, I think that um, particularly when you have this older lady who comes in, 58 years old, and says, "You know, I'm short of breath on exertion," I think you've got to expand your differential and not just think that this is asthma. And really, and part of that process is demonstrating yes, they have asthma, or no, they don't have asthma. Now, she could have had asthma plus a PE. I mean that, and so then you have to think if they're not responding to the therapy, then you know think again about another diagnosis. Or with PEs, you can get the bronchospastic component without real asthma, based on some other mediators from platelets and, mm -hmm. and other sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of ways you can conjure up some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. But but I think if, if um, you don't have that objective evidence with a good history, you know that meets ACS requirements for reversibility, I think you've got to look to take the next step to be absolutely sure of the diagnosis. Uh, well, in the case that you finished up with, mm -hmm. this, this case right here, obviously this is a case where multiple drugs are being thrown at a patient, sort of haphazardly in a sense. The patient was on Advair, I'm using a brand name now. You know, tachycardia or not, the patient still was not doing well, so the odds that 
switching the flow vent, their asthma is going to get better. And then that you're going to add leukose to that, and that's going to help. This is just an example of just throwing drugs randomly without thinking about what you're doing. We do see that in primary care, and we criticize that all the time, and that's not a very thoughtful way to, to take care of patients. But, but I'm not sure that you know, doing this objective stuff for every patient is going to necessarily be feasible, especially, I mean, you're obviously dealing with adults. Right. And children, you know, six-year-old, seven-year-old, a lot of times they are only sick when they have a cold. Right. And they're not going to have a decrease in lung function. We're not going to see it. We're not going to get reversibility. All we're going to get is a history that they got a cold and were wheezing and now they're fine, but they're, until they get their next cold, we're not going right. to know. So right. that's maybe a little bit different. No, I, I agree, yeah. I mean, pediatrics can be very different than, than adults. Yes. But, you know, in adults, there's a lot of other things that can cause... Yeah, it's a lot more complicated. Yeah, I agree with that. It's we had, like, somebody from pulmonology give us a talk in P saying that they didn't really think that, um, kind of what you're saying, that reflux doesn't play a role, that it, in kids and asthma, that it's not the same. It, either it's a separate entity, but it doesn't, like, exacerbate or worsen that kind of thing. I think that reflux uh, definitely causes respiratory symptoms. Right. Cough, chest tightness, right. fetal yeah, production. Yeah. Um, but it may not actually cause asthma. <coughs> I've never thought that reflux was a cause of asthma. Right. I've always thought that it was a separate trigger. disease that could maybe trigger it or have next to some symptoms, and yet it was always listed as one of the differential diagnoses. Mm. It's not a differential diagnosis as a cause. It's, right. a, it's a different thing that might it, trigger it. It's a comorbid condition. Comorbid. 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 Like chronic sinusitis right. and all of yeah. that stuff. It's comorbidity, not a triggering factor or a direct factor. I, yeah. I wanted to just make a point about uh, point that Gary made about steroids. Um, usually when you make the decision about whether to go to a choline challenge or another kind of provocation test to make a diagnosis or to rule it out, um, those patients are already on steroids. And in some ways it's impractical to maybe stop the steroids uh, before you would actually do this kind of test. And I would submit that if you have true asthma, a methacholine challenge for somebody who's been on steroids just a short period of time, you're in a long period of time, is probably not going to interfere with the methacholine challenge. For the individuals who are, uh, or who have asthma, and you know, I, again, this is one of my ideas about this, is that a methacholine challenge is maybe a better indication of the possibility that there's been remodeling, because it doesn't reverse with steroids necessarily either inhaled over long-term or short-term treatment. There's maybe one doubling of the dose, which is essentially what those steps at either 5 or 10 are. It's a doubling dose increase in terms of the methacholine. But there's really no more than a one-step or two-step change with an acute pulse. Uh, and the ones who are methacholine sensitive are going to stay that way even to the point where they may not change even with a burst of steroids. I mean, they may get better, their sputomy is silly goes away, even their FEV1 may improve, but their methacholine sensitivity is probably not going to change with modulation of the steroids in the short term. So you should be less, so if you have a, if you're taking a methacholine challenge, you have a patient who's got an FEV1 of 60%, you probably, if they think it's 60% from asthma and not COPD or some other kind of thing, you're better off giving them a burst of steroids to get them to a good level. And if you then have to think of doing a methacholine challenge, you're probably not going to interfere with it. But all the other points about stopping the short, medium-term medications that Gary mentioned in terms of the glutatrine inhibitors and antihistamines and, and the anticholinergics, you need to follow those kinds of things with the methacholine challenge. But steroids is a separate circumstance in terms of thinking about it. At least that's the way I approach it. No, I agree. You know, from a practical perspective, how, how difficult is it to, act, to actually do a methacholine challenge in a physician's office? It's not really an office no. procedure, is it? It's not an office procedure. I so think we're you talking have to have facilities for resuscitation. Occasionally. Yeah. So we're talking about family physicians and general practitioners out in, a, in offices usually with asthma, lots of asthma, it's one of the more common things that they see. And if there's a need to do a methacholine challenge to document that they have asthma, obviously if they do spirometry and get reversibility, that's great, but that's not always the case. Right. Do you think that they should be referring them 
to your facility for methylcholine challenges, and are you the person that should be seeing those patients? Uh, at least to get the diagnosis confirmed? Yeah, certainly the patients that, like the first case I presented, they're not responding to asthma medication. Well, obviously, yeah. then you would definitely be the one to, to right. see, but this lady, obviously didn't respond either, but but the average asthmatic who didn't have a low FEV1 but responded pretty well and said she was okay, does she need to see you and get a medical point? I mean, I think it depends on the individual circumstance, but I think the main thing is if the asthma medicines aren't working, they, they need to be seen. Yeah. And then you also need to always think about alternative diagnosis when they have a normal one function. Yeah. I mean, in the back of your mind, you always, could this be something else? Could this be another problem? So, I mean, I think it's obviously on, on a case-by-case basis. -case. There are clearly people that have a very classical history and that you can, and they have a classical response to medication. But, I mean, even a simple thing you can do is give them peak flow meter, have it taken home, and then look at peak flow variability. And that's mm -hmm. another way to diagnose asthma. You can do it on peak flow variability. If you can see that peak flow variability, then I think you can demonstrate, you know, your reversibility without doing a challenge. And that's something a primary care doc can do, is look at, at peak flow variability. Mm -hmm. What about BCD and peak flow in terms of, like, again, their effort if they're having somebody, we had mentioned trying to do that with a patient to distinguish it was kind of like a new onset issue in a 12, 13-year-old who is athletic and that was when they're having problems. And so we had talked about doing peak flow, but then everybody kind of argued that maybe it's too effort dependent that they would still drop their peak flow if they were having, if they were, you know, exercising and had a BCD attack. A lot of times that seen in BCD, the peak flows are normal because it's more inspiratory than expiratory. Right, right. So I, I think that, you know, those people I think really need laryngoscopy. I mean, for those people I think you really need to do laryngoscopy, not only to diagnose the BCD, to make sure that they don't have another upper airway problem. I've seen people with vocal cord tumors and subglottic stenosis and other anatomical problems right. that have had a diagnosis of BCD. So laryngoscopy, I think you have to really look at the cords to make sure that this is a functional problem and not a, you know, a pathological problem. Right. Is manitol safe in the clinic and can that induce VCD or is that not? I think manitol is the safest methacholine. Uh, the thing about manitol though, it actually is more sensitive to like inhaled steroids. So inhaled steroids will have more of an effect in blunting a manitol test than it will mm -hmm. the choline challenge. So, but manitol is, is probably, but I mean, I think for all the bronchial provocation, it's still recommended that you have the sensitivity how they are marketing that to like so that you could do those in your office. Or I think that yeah. medical is not a direct agonist, so yeah. like methacholine. So that's indirect. why it's sensitive to these other. Right, yeah. but I think that still in the in the package insert, they would say you have to have sensitive equipment and people that are ACLF certified. You know that would probably be you know in there just in case we're right, right, scenario. Right. With somebody that well, very interesting. Well, th thank you so All much right. for this update. We really appreciate it and. Sure. Uh, certainly food for thoughts. We're going to have to stop here. I would like to point out that Dr. Salzman's presentation will be available online in a few days uh, and available for CME. Uh, so if you log on to uh, the website, uh, which is right here, uh, and click on the little orange things, you'll be able to get to the CME website and uh, get free CME. Um, so we're going to stop there. Um, this is the Conference of Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Have a great week, everyone, and we'll see you next time. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about Conferences Online Allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to www.acaai.org. See you next time.